Spitzer, and I want to welcome you to the 2014 NEA 
National Heritage Fellows Concert. Always good to be here. <laughs> and uh, what you've had a chance to experience is uh, really something uh, out of deep tidewater, Maryland and Delaware. Uh, some people call it a prayer meeting or a camp meeting. And we're going to talk to Reverend Colbert here. Colbert here, here in, uh, I, I can't say this is the Colbert show, can I? No, I better you not do that. Yeah, good. No, no we don't. You no, he, maybe he'll change his name and say it like you do. Yes. I don't know. Uh, Reverend, uh, tell us a little bit about where this tradition came from. Uh, this is a tradition that goes back over 150 some odd years. It's something that we inherited from the days of slavery and from the coast of West Africa. Mm -hmm. And that's where this tradition um, came from, and it's still uh, I'm just going to ask, how do you get all the people out from rural Maryland and uh, Delaware to the stage tonight? By the grace of God. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, it, it's not the promised land here, but it looks pretty good, and it sounds pretty great. Uh, we really so thank you for undertaking that. Uh, tell me, uh, the circle, what's the circle about? Well, the circle uh, responds to the Mona's Bench, okay? The Mona's Bench in that time was where sinners came to get prayed over and sinners gave their life to Christ. The purpose of marching around that circle is the tradition of the old African ring shout mm -hmm. and where in the beginning the men spoke to the ladies and then in turn the ladies turned around and spoke to us. Yeah. Well, so you, you took what goes on in everyday life yes. and put it in that sacred circle. Uh, how many churches are together in this particular uh, group? How many of you pulled? I would say approximately 25, 26 churches yeah. uh, from um, Central Maryland, Baltimore City, Dorchester County, and Delaware. So you've pulled them together. Now, how did you personally become uh, a reverend in this church? I mean, this has got to be a long walk for you to be here this evening with all these good people. Well, the Reverend has nothing to do with this church, their no. band. Yeah. <laughs> um, the Reverend came later after the prayer band, and I just inherit that position as their leader. Okay. Yeah. 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 And you say band, but yeah. there's no instruments except uh, the God given, what did we say? That's it. <laughs> that's the instrument. Box humana and uh, a yeah, little, yeah, little body instrument. percussion. <laughs> well, uh, give him and the whole group another round of applause. <laughs> Reverend. Reverend Jerry Colbert with us, the singing and praying bands of uh, Maryland and Virginia. Well, you know, we start off with this incredible joyful noise unto the Lord, and it might seem that if we go to the Adirondack forests of upstate New York, it would be quiet. But time of year with certain people, you hear something. It's the pounding of logs, ash white ash and black ash to make baskets. And that is a sound that Henry Arquette is quite familiar with. He's a former iron worker from the Mohawk Nation who returned to his reservation in upstate New York to come back to the tradition of his father and grandfather basket making. Let's meet him, Henry Arquette. <laughs> All right, Mr. Henry, good to see you. Right here. Yeah, yeah. T tell me uh, your name in, in uh, your native language. And what does that mean? Firekeeper. Firekeeper. Is that the keeper of tradition? How do, how do we understand firekeeper? Well, I don't know how, but that, uh, that was my grandfather's name. Yeah. And that was a long time ago when he got that name. Okay. Well, we'll assume you've got the spark within you. Would you like to have a seat over here for a second? We yeah. Can, we can talk about it? Okay. Sure. Let me help you get over there. You, uh, you spent a lot of years down in New York City up on Big Steel, I know. Around oh, the country, too. Yeah, around the country, New York. And uh, I went as far as Tucson, Arizona. Did you? And... Uh, it gets hot down there. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I'm less worried about how, how hot it is, but how high it is. H how did Mohawks get involved in this, this high, high level work up there in the I know, I, from what I hear, they were building a small bridge right in Hogansburg, and they got Indians to hire them. You know, that was before the, um, they had 
strong uh, unions. Mm -hmm. And they got, they got in there and they done the work and they found out that they, they could cl climb around that iron easier than anybody else. Yeah. So you climbed around quite a bit of iron in your life. Oh, yes. I, I. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, there is something kind of amazing about coming back to, uh, to wood. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, how you, uh, you select the wood for this kind of basket, the type of wood. Tell us a bit about it. Well, I really didn't select it. My father was the only one that done this kind of work, and that's what he used. I see. And he learned that from his father. Mm -hmm. So when you do something like that, you it goes to the next generation. Right. So I guess uh, what was selected was you to do this work. And tell us the kind of wood you've got on the outside. Well, uh, on the outside, that's uh, black ash. That's all the weaves and the bottom. And the handles are made out of uh, white ash. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's strong. Yeah. You know, you, it don't break. But when, uh, to, to, do the, to do this, to bend it like that and let it stay, I put it in the water for maybe three days. Mm. When I get it back out, then I bend it. Yeah. I have a little gadget that I put in there, make sure that they all got the same kind of a bend. Now, now what brought you back from uh, work in the big city up on the buildings to back to the forest to do this kind of work? Well, uh, some years ago, in the winter time, we didn't have much work right. where, where we live. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, you have to find something to do, either draw unemployment, you can do that, make baskets, you can survive. Yeah, and so you came back to make baskets and not only have you survived, you've thrived. You're here tonight with beautiful baskets. Let, let's take a look at what we've got over here, okay? This is an amazing lineup. Um, what should we start with? How about, how about this one here? Oh, this one here is a, a laundry basket. Yeah, okay. That's a pretty good size laundry basket. <laughs> well, you, you fill that up with wet clothes. I don't think you're going to pick it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, the, that's a case where the basket might be better than the clothes, I'll tell you. That's yeah, incredible. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now, let's see. We, we've got a, a really big one back here with an unusual mm -hmm. shape to it, a kind of oval top. It comes down to a square, but it's bows out. <laughs> well, I call this uh, a moose basket. Uh-huh. Because one of um, my buddies bought the, this basket from me. He went moose hunting, and he left it on the a, on a ground, went back to his camp. He come back, and it was gone. <laughs> you don't think a moose took it, do you? No, I no, I, I, <laughs> Another moose. No, no. Somebody else took it. Yeah, yeah, two-legged moose. Well, but but it, why a moose? Why is it called a moose basket? That's why I called it a moose basket. Oh. <laughs> that's how he lost <laughs> <laughs> you know, I heard this story differently <laughs> earlier today. <laughs> Something about carrying uh, field dressed moose meat back to uh, the camp. Well, they, that's what they said they were going to do, you know, go moose hunting, put their, cut up the meat and yeah. put it in here, and a couple of men can carry it back right. to See, wherever but, they want to go. Well, this is one of the things with, with, with traditional crafts and folk arts is that, that they often have something very practical about them, but now we see them as so beautiful, those two-legged moose just want to carry them away. <laughs> <laughs> That's what happens. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's, let's go back around the life cycle here for a minute. Mm -hmm. If we could, I'll put the moose basket back, and uh, what do you want to show us from up here that, that oh, well. fits in? How about this one? You're going to go right back to, I think we were, I thought we were going in reverse order. We we're going to the wedding basket first. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, then again. I'll take this one and. Uh, I shouldn't be interrupting your flow. That's just yeah, really, really is, uh, rude. Oh, somebody tied it up, did they? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, it don't matter. No. Let's just show them, let's just show them the interior yeah. a little bit. Yeah. So how do you, how do you call this one? Uh, I've, I haven't made baskets in a while. And, I know what they are, but I forget. You know, 
That's what happens when you get Okay, so, so, well, you know, I, I'll take a wild guess and say picnic yeah. basket. Um, Maybe but, it'll come back after Yeah, it can be. You, I guess uh, you can name it by how it's used. Now, which one was the wedding basket? Was it this one or this? This is a smaller one. This yeah. here is the okay. wedding basket. Right. Somebody went and tied all these baskets. Yeah. Yeah, I think some some stores decided they're gonna. You know, I don't know what well, we got to be careful. But but so you call. Uh, I don't know about that. Ah, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Let's just leave that one go. We'll we'll we'll. we'll, we'll <laughs> this is uh, a wedding. Some two-legged moose did that, no doubt. Uh, this well, is a wedding. Why is it a wedding basket? Well, when uh, people get married, each of them carry a basket. Mm -hmm. It can be this kind or any any other kind. Yeah. But it's uh, so I made a small basket like this and called it a wedding basket. Okay. And and what would people put in the basket at the wedding? Well, uh, from what I hear, they put cloth in here. Uh huh. And he, the 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 man carries a cloth, and the woman carries food. I see. That means. Some kind of a food is in here. Okay, well, th so that's they, essential that's what, to the uh, that, to, to making they, the family and getting yeah, together. That, uh, a little clothing, a little shelter, a little bit of food. Yeah, yeah. good. And, I, and then I, you know, I, I don't think we even need to go here, uh, <laughs> but but it is amazing. <laughs> you want to say anything about this while we're uh, up here? I mean, this is the big one. Oh, <clears> this is. Uh, that's where the two-legged moose goes. <laughs> bassinet. <laughs> bassinet. <laughs> yeah. Well, bassinet. It, it took me a long while to figure out how to do this. I'm sure. Yeah, amazing but, in, but anyhow, this is how it ended up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I see that. And, and, and this is how you ended up as a National Heritage Fellow. <laughs> we're, we're, we're so glad that you came here. It's fantastic to see Same your work. Here, yeah. Give him a round of applause. <laughs> Henry Arquette. Do you want to say your name in Mohawk? Do you want to know your anything? Uh, yeah. say, uh, say, say good night, or you're glad to hear I asked, uh, I asked Henry if he'd like to say something to you uh, in his language. I'm glad I met you guys. <laughs> Henry Arquette. Thank you, Henry Arquette. Beautiful. Thank you. Glad to have you here. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's all right. It's good. Yeah, that's one reason I like this show, is you guys. <laughs> Everyone feels pretty good about this show. We enjoy doing it, and it's one of my favorite things every year. How many of you are repeat folks who've come to this? All right. That's good. You're in the know. You know, I spent some years down in Austin, uh, Texas, and uh, I, uh, I did some radio there. I was supposed to be in graduate school, but I spent time on a radio station called Coke FM, of all things. Uh, goat Roper Radio, I know, I know. Uh, and, uh, it, you know, it's hippie country. We used to call it crooked country, uh, country rock, all that stuff. But there was also a tremendous Tejano scene in Austin, uh, and of course, down to San Antonio. It's very well known. Uh, we heritage uh, recipients have included some of the great conjunto players, uh, like Flaco Jimenez and others. Um, but I don't think that generally out across uh, the scene in Texas there was as much awareness outside of the Me Mexican American or Chicano communities of the orchestra music. And the orchestra music uh, involves kind of a mingling uh, of the, the boleros and the rancheras uh, with jazz and early rock and roll, and it's a, you know, it was big time dance music, cabaret, and club music. And uh, the gentleman who's coming out here is a musician, uh, a composer, multi instrumentalist, very well known over the years in the Austin club scene and all around Texas. And uh, I would like you to make him welcome, Manuel Cowboy Donley. <laughs> Senor, es para usted. Uh-oh, say it again. I hope you enjoyed the last program. 
going to be good. Let me see if someone turned this on. We got another mic here, folks? Testing, testing, testing. Yeah, we've been like this on the bandstand, I know. Uh, so. <laughs> it's on? Yeah? It's on? Okay, well, you, if, you're, if it's on, you're on. Okay. <laughs> okay, so. And look, by the way, should we tell them Sylvia's over here? Your daughter Sylvia's here with you. Yeah. Want, I just wanted to say that. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. She's going to sing. You'll enjoy her. Yeah. She sings beautiful. I'm, I'm her daddy. <laughs> 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 uh, however, we're going to do our best. Here we and, go. And uh, I'm here to do what I do best. Barely, that is. And, uh, <laughs> well, so t tell them a little bit about your, your family history. Where were you born? Go we'll back to the born in Durango, Durango, capital of Durango, and uh, by, uh, but uh, my dad is an American citizen. He was in the First World War. Mm. His twin brother got killed in, in Germany by a martyr shell. Mm. So that made me, uh, they made me a, a citizen from the day I was born. Yeah. American citizen, that is. And, and, you, and uh, your daddy played? Oh, he played, he was a bit too, so he played classical violin. He was, but I don't know what attracted me mostly was uh, the guitar. When I heard it, I, I was at nine years old, I was painting, and the teachers couldn't believe what I could paint and draw and all that. But when I heard the guitar, I forgot about all that. And I said, that's what I want to do. I quit school, because I was behind anyhow. <laughs> and, and I got me a job washing dishes for $9 a week. And I put me a guitar and lay away. Took me forever to pay it out, but the rest is history. Yeah, indeed it is. Now, now uh, when we hear your name, uh, Donnelly, where's the Donnelly come in? From Ireland. My great grandfather, Daniel Donnelly, and landed here in somewhere in the South Texas. And uh, my grandfather, Arcadio Donnelly, well, I knew him. He practically raised us because my daddy was always playing in Louisiana and, and far away. So my grandfather was there for us, and we were nine of us. Mm. And he was, so I remember where I came from. Oh, yeah. My well, grandfather was there. The, the, the Irish-Mexican connection is, is strong from Texas all the way into Southern California. Working on the rail lines, the Irish workers came in, and, and families emerged that were, well, with names like Donnelly. And, uh, Vaqueros that were sort of Irish Mexican cowboys. Uh, that's quite a potent combination. Obviously, nine children, and uh, <laughs> also in the band, a few we'll see. But but uh, tell me the nickname cowboy. I see you got the well, hat, the bolero. It right, goes right along with the uh, the guitar. You know, the first cowboy was Gene Autry, the singing cowboy. That is, and that's what I used to do. Except the only difference he he had a, a real four-legged horse, and I had a horse that I could sweep the house with. And that was my horse. <laughs> but I could sing, or I, I thought I could anyhow. Yeah. I knew a chord and now you could sing country. Yeah. And, and when I got older and I learned to play and then had a band, before I knew it, I was in front of the microphone because nobody would like to sing. They, they were too smart. And being the dumbest, I wind up in front of the microphone. <laughs> My bad. Uh, oh, well, that, that was what's going on in the mid fifties, and that's how I, 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 I packed every house in Texas where I, where I played on a Monday morning, raining, cold, it would be packed because I had all the all the rock and roll and and the ballads from uh, Mexico with a. Uh, Trumpet, altos, and tenors, and all that, and that became the Tejano sound, you know, orchestra sound, big sound, electric bass, electric. Everybody still had those big upright bull fiddles. Yeah. And I uh, brought in an electric one, and I made my own guitar because I couldn't afford to buy a guitar. I made electric guitar, and I started playing all the rock and roll and yeah. with with electric guitar. So before I knew it, I was cowboy Donnelly. Uh, <laughs> You know, I I didn't plan it that way, and but I'm, to this day I'm still known as my own cowboy. Band. I like it, and you've got your orchestra. Would you like to hear the band? Okay, pa vamos a tocar un poquito de la música, okay? Okay. Let's sure. go with it. Sure.
Give him a round of applause. Manuel, Cowboy Donnelly, y su orquesta. some of the songs I composed in 58, thereabouts, and I still get the royal, the royal check, and I recorded 1958, so I must have did something right. For y'all, for your listening pleasure, here's one of my creations. Adios, chiquita. My daughter, what can I say? <laughs> the name of this song is called uh, La Barca de Oro, which translates to um, the golden boat.
number that I recorded in 1965, and I'm known for this selection. Wherever I go, that's, that's all they want to hear, and they will not let me live on till I play it. So I guess I might as well do, do it here too. Something entitled Flor del Rio, Flower of the River. Manuel Cowboy Donnelly and Sylvia Donnelly. I got some more kinfolk here. Guadalupe Donnelly on keys. Philip Donnelly on bass, also in the band. Johnny Alba on drums. Fernando Soto on sax. Des, Des Armo also on sax. Philip Barrero and Marcos. So Staita on trumpet. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you so much. Great to hear that. <laughs> Texas Mexican orchestra sound. Just, just fantastic. Well, we're going to come a little closer to where we are tonight, to the city of Philadelphia, but also really to the country called the Ukraine, or Ukraine. Vera Nano uh, Nako Nechny is a weaver a bead worker, a teacher, and a keeper, really, of the Ukrainian traditional arts. Let's make her welcome. Vera, come on out. <laughs> How are you? Looking good, Vera. Looks good. Oh, it looks fantastic. <laughs> it does indeed. Uh, tell us how you got interested in uh, the Ukrainian arts of dress and costume? Well, I always embroidered. And then when I came to the to United States, I started doing, oh, God almighty, sorry. It's OK, baby. It's OK. This is trademark. I, no, yeah. <laughs> she, she called it her signature the other night. That's you, right. you know what it is? I, I know that when you're crying, you're really happy. Yeah, yeah I am. OK. Back to, back to how you learned. Back to, <laughs> but anyway, I wanted to learn all the stitches in Ukraine. And being that my mother was from 
the mountain region. I wanted her to learn her, her style, and this is it. And I found a teacher who was able and willing to teach me, who also became like my mother. And she was the one that taught me the stitches, the embroidery, the weaving sash, and also how to do the leather work and other pieces that go along with the head pieces. Mm -hmm. Today I am wearing her, oh God, her jacket or her vest in honor of her to have her with me. <laughs> <laughs> and um, here, I'll pick this up for you. Her, her <laughs> Thank you. So her, so her teacher received the Heritage Award early when I was yes. doing the program in 1999. Yeah, in so give us her full name. Eudokia Sorohanyuk. Okay, and, and she's from the village of? She is the village from the mountain region and Verkhovena, which it was called Jrabia before it got changed. In the east? Uh, in the west. Oh, west, oh in the west. Okay, that's the further west, Ukraine. that's right. Yes, okay. in the mountain region. Okay, back in that direction. Yeah. Okay. And, and uh, here's the thing that interests me is after she got her award, I got a letter in the mail saying that she was uh, wondering how it went and how did people feel about it and mainly asking suggestions. She sent out apparently 50 letters with stamped return envelopes. And I saved mine. I thought I had it with me tonight, but of course it's at the hotel. But, but I remember writing back to her and just saying, the best thing you can probably do is, is find apprentices and, te and teach them. And you were already with her at that point. Oh, yes, point. yes. She taught 15 years ago. Yes. She taught few of us. I know Eudokia uh, since 1980s. And then shortly after that, I started being one of her apprentices and going to her house. And, and many of us did that. Yeah. And she taught us weaving, embroidering, the headpieces, and all the metal work, mm. how to do the wedding head pieces and all that. And she lived in what, Pensacola, New Jersey, Pensauken. South Jersey. So yeah. there's, there's, there's a pretty good size Ukrainian yes. community around yes. there. So you could yes, get together sir. and yeah. build things up, you know, here that might be, you know, needed help mm -hmm. over there and vice versa, get back and mm -hmm. forth. Can we bring out our, uh, I hate to call them models exactly, <laughs> uh, but uh, they do look pretty great, I will say. <laughs> Vera, to tell us tell us what we have here. This is Poltava region. It's central Ukraine. This could be worn as a wedding uh, attire, or like for holidays and different affairs, she could also wear this. Mm -hmm. um, and basically now. They also you almost call this the national costume. You see uh, this associated a lot with the Ukrainian, with the Ukrainian costume. Mm -hmm. um, so this is Kathleen. We renamed her Katya <laughs> in Ukrainian. <laughs> Katarina, Katarina, <laughs> Catherine. And uh, so this is Catherine. This isn't. Oh. By the way, I also wove this skirt. Oh, I, I went to Ukraine to learn how to weave this because this was an art that was pretty hard to find. Mm. So I spent like a month and a half in Ukraine learning and sitting at the loom and learning how to do that. So this is one of mine. All this is all mine that I did. Hey, before we move all the way over to the wedding crown, uh, what, what, what's the technical term for these? Oh, they are the pom-poms. That's what I'm talking about, the pom-pom. <laughs> but I've never seen a pom-pom quite like this. These are the multicolored pom-poms yes, of yes. distinctive uh, village dress in, yes, in, in Ukraine. Yes, this is very much, and also <laughs> the peacock feathers ah, were yes. very mm -hmm. much used uh, very nice. as a, you know, as okay. a de decoration. Yes. Okay, back, back to the crown back here. Back to Antonia, who is my sister, and here not, I mean, she had no choice, let's put it this way. <laughs> 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 she was drafted. Uh, this is a strictly a wedding hat gear. And in here, there's a lot of elements. Um, 
The headpiece is done out of goose feathers. Each flower has 36 feathers. And it had to be from the goose, just from the neck piece. So to do a headpiece like that takes about four, four poor souls that had to give their lives. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, there's like 30, 32 flowers plus the decor in the middle. And the, the, so this is her wedding as she went to church to get married. Yeah. Once after the ceremony was done, could you turn? They took this harness off. She took three Advils because she had a headache from this. Yeah, yeah, how heavy, <laughs> how heavy is that? Uh, heavy. Heavy? Heavy. How heavy That's is it, sister? Heavy. 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 <laughs> We only use technical terms here when we're talking my, my uh, traditional costume. My husband welded. It's all welded. Oh, so, really? Yeah. <laughs> Turn around. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's new information for me. Yeah. So <laughs> then this comes off, and she places this in back of her head, uh -huh. and she spends the rest of the evening only in this. Now, turning it around, yeah. uh, this is what I like, peel back the layers. This is really, really, yeah, Wait a I minute. mean, In here, wow. there is a cloth, and this is called, what they call the rantuch. Rantuch for them, it, it's different names for different villages. Uh, it's a cloth that once she's married, she is going to put that over her head. And from then on, say amen, because your head is always covered. So, so she goes to church, and this is blessed as she goes through her ceremony. So when she comes after the ceremony, everything is taken off, and that goes on ahead. And she's no longer a maiden. Um, so other than that, it's all the jacket, that everything. They, they loved colors, the Hutus and the mountain region and near, they loved colors. So what they did, they used what they had. They used a lot of wool. Uh, the headpiece that it goes with my outfit also had a lot of wool, a lot of colorful wool. Uh, so that's basically uh, what I could think of. This is an old costume. This was worn by a bride. I was able to get this whole attire of exception of the headpiece that I did. And uh, I had feathers all over my house. <laughs> <laughs> if that's the worst thing that ever yeah. happened, I, no. I, you know. <laughs> but Vera, I just want to thank you for dressing Aww. your community, taking care of your community yes. here and abroad. These are tough times, and it's so important yes. what you're doing with culture well, and the it costume is, and textiles. So thank it is you. important for me. I need to pass this on, and I think this is my calling, it, to be able to teach others to my culture, as Eudokia taught me. Right. I want to teach And others. to do it in Philadelphia for America and Brotherly the world. Brotherly love. There you go. Thank you so much. <laughs> Give her a round of applause. Vera Nakolnichny, Ukrainian costumery. Beautiful. That wasn't so bad. <laughs> wow. Rufus White is a very different kind of keeper of traditions in a way, and yet there are similarities here. He is from the Omaha tribe. He learned songs and stories from his grandfather, his uncles, uh, and his father. Uh, one of his uncles said, if you uh, pay attention uh, to, uh, to us, uh, you might be a singer one day. And he says, I did that. I'd like you to meet him. He's a great person, Rufus White. How you doing, Rufus? Looking so good. Thank you. The thing I like about Mr. White is how, how cool he has been. Everywhere he goes, he just no problem. He's himself. He's in, you've been enjoying yourself. Oh, yeah. 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 W would you mind telling him uh, your name in, in the Omaha language? My Indian name was given to me by my grandfather. Shudagina is my Indian name. What it means is it calls for smoke. Okay. 
Yeah. And uh, we, uh, we have a couple of your, uh, your grandsons here, and they're going to sing an honoring song for you. Yeah. So let's see if we can get Evan and uh, Creighton out here. Yeah. Like this. I don't know what to say. <laughs> no, very I, thankful. Beautiful. I want to say thank you to my grandsons. Exactly. For, uh, Amazing. Well, and I was just going to say, what what goes through your mind when you when you hear an honoring song like that? What what are they singing to you? Well, they call me as a leader. What it means, the song. New Dahanga Moni. Yeah. That means a leader up ahead. Yeah, and, and this, this was a surprise to you to receive yes. this, I know. Yes. Yeah. yeah, fabulous. This is quite an honor. Thank you. <laughs> That's the, the heritage reward uh, from within. You uh, ha had been telling us about uh, fasting and, and going up, uh, up onto a hill or a yeah. ridge. Yeah. Uh, could you talk a little bit about those experiences uh, and where they've come yeah. from for you? Yeah. I was uh, growing up, and I used to hear my grandmother talk about fasting on the hill four days and nights. And uh, uh, it came to my mind one night I had a dream that I was going on the hill. And uh, I had two adopted brothers. They were, had the same feeling. They called me up. We went to South Dakota, Rosebud, South Dakota. We went up there, uh, fasted up there, four days and nights. And uh, <clears throat> I thought to myself, what am I putting myself through, you know? But at the same time, the spirits were there with me. And I, <clears throat> I finally realized what I was gonna learn from that. And there was a long time for me to go without water and food for four days and nights. And I, I made it. <laughs> <laughs> you did. So, yeah. Anyway, I, I had experience seeing all these timber wolves around me and the hoot owls are hollering out. Yeah. In the morning, they start hollering out. I guess all the time they were blessing me, watching over me. You weren't I afraid of the timber wolves. No, I wasn't scared after that. Knowing that I had protection. Yeah. Maybe they could eat me up. Maybe they, you know, had real taste of food. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they weren't necessarily, they, they were fasting too. Yeah. yeah. So I really enjoyed that, you know. Yeah. I, I get through. With all the experiences uh, that you had uh, growing up, uh, inside uh, tribal tradition. You yeah. also reached out of uh, the tribe because you became known as a singer at the powwows. Yeah. Not just uh, among yeah. the Omaha, yeah. but all across yeah. uh, uh, the Sioux Cattle country Drive, and yeah. everywhere. Yeah. 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 
I went clear to New Mexico. I even went down to Texas and Oklahoma. And I have relatives down there that always want me to help them sing. Yeah, so, yeah. And that was an honor for me. Oh, yeah, and I'm sure I know life. they appreciate yeah. you. Well, we have somebody here who appreciates your work, was influenced by your work. In 1999, he received the National Heritage Fellowship. And uh, some of you may know him. His name is Kevin Locke. Let's see if we can get Kevin out here to join us. Yeah. All right, Kevin, thank you for coming out this evening. T tell us about your experiences uh, with, with Rufus Fly. Uh, I've known Rufus for over uh, 40 years, and he's, uh, we've done a lot of collaboration in the past. And I'd like to say that, um, you know, uh, you probably are aware that I think the most prominent, one of the strongest and most unifying movements in Indian country is what they call powwows. Right. Pa in English, they yeah. say powwows. Yeah. But um, in, in my language, the Lakota language, we don't say that. We say uh, the, the, the dance itself we call Omaha Wachipi because it came from the Omaha tribe. And the, and the basis of all that is the, the music, the songs, the Omaha Oloa, uh -huh. the Omaha song. And so, uh, these, uh, this tradition is uh, the, uh, the Lakota, the Dakota people obtained that in the 1800s. And that became the unifying force because uh, the songs are to encourage um, people to arise to be of service, to perform uh, altruistic, self-abnegating acts of service for the people. And that's the basis of the music. And this is what inspired the people to take that on. It's just diffused now. You go everywhere, Indian country, you can find this. Yeah. Well, I know we've been talking about the map. And, and uh, Rufus had mentioned to me, kind of with a grin, that uh, his, the res is about 90 miles north of, of Omaha, but south of the Iowa border in Sioux City. So there's, there is that sense of expanse of the land and tribe. Where did you uh, come up? Uh, in, I, I'm from a little community called Wakapala, which is on the, uh, it's on the Missouri River, just like uh, Omaha tribe is on the Missouri, but it's uh, kind of up on the North Dakota state line, just between Bismarck and Pierre. Yeah. yeah. And it's great that you, you are, became aware not just of his uh, powwow, but also that you know the history of the importance of, of the people. The, oh, yeah. yeah. We, use, we, we know that. If we use our language, we know that where it comes from, the Omaha yeah. tribe. So I think uh, we were going to ask if you would be willing to do a hoop dance uh, with Mr. White. And he's going to uh, drum and sing for him. Give them both a round of applause as we get set here. Rufus White. And Kevin Locke.
With his grandsons and nephews. It's all family here. Dustin and Darrow and the war dance. Rufus White, the man we honor tonight with the National Heritage Fellowship from the Omaha Nation, uh, now in what is known as Nebraska. Well, we wanted to talk about the NEA for just a moment. Uh, somebody told me, that just as with hoops, uh, life is intricate. Uh, I don't want to say uh, we go through hoops exactly. No one can do it as well as Kevin Locke. But in everything we do, whether we're in a, a federal agency or out in the communities, we try to work together in different ways and uh, try and keep things moving smoothly. We want to thank Lisner Auditorium here at George Washington University. It's looking real good. I used to come here for uh, the shows of Little Feet, The Kinks, all kinds of people here. Some great shows. Some of you, maybe you came to some of them. And uh, I, I, some nights it smelled a little different than it does tonight in here. Uh, you know, but it's, it's looking really fine. Um, this concert, this event is produced by our good friends of the National Council for the Traditional Arts. Do all these great folk festivals. Wolf Trap and down in Richmond, up in Bangor and all over keeping that traditional live since the 30s, and uh, uh, this show is managed by Madeline Ramez, who many of you know. She always brings her own uh, uh, song and prayer band, and I love to hear you guys. Uh, and, and Julie Olin is the director of the NCTA, and our concert director, show director tonight is Dennis Blackledge, so thank you so much. Over at the NEA, uh, Cheryl's Sheely takes care of the good folks uh, for heritage and helps get this all together. And uh, let's see, we also want to acknowledge the work of our sign language interpreter, Miyako Rankin. Now, all week long, uh, Jane Chu, the new chair of the NEA, a very charming lady, we have just enjoyed so much has uh, been celebrating with us, and I know she's enjoying the show. And uh, I also want to mention that uh, in the house tonight, we have her, uh, shall we say, parallel. It's the arts and humanities, the two endowments. And tonight, the new chair uh, of the National Endowment for the Humanities, a person I hold in great uh, reverence, and is Bro Adams is in the house. And I don't know if he's out there. Wave, bro, if you can. A great humanist. And uh, I also want to make mention of uh, another person who I would maybe say bro or brother to in a way. For 29 years, Barry Burgey has been the beloved director of the Folk and Traditional Arts program. He grew through and into that position over the years, working with Bess Lomax Hawes and Dan Sheehy. And uh, we love him. He works so well with so many people. He's retiring this fall. And uh, we're just so happy that you're here. Barry, again, I, I know you're out there somewhere uh, in the dark, but uh, you're a humble fellow, and I know what you would tell me right now. Get on with the show. <laughs> the show kind of connects to what Barry's been doing at this point. Uh, each year, uh, we give the best Lomax Hawes Award. Uh, we all knew Bess and worked with her over the years. There is kind of an extended family uh, in the NEA. And, and Bess's vision of the world uh, was interesting to me uh, in a time when we, you know, have so much contestation about what community means, what culture means, all manner of different things. Bess felt very strongly that in having these extraordinary people uh, from everyday communities, it was a way to represent something ideal. And, and she didn't run from the idea of an ideal or a hoped for a community or a hoped for way of expressing oneself. In fact, she embraced it and encouraged those spaces and people and places. And so the Best Lomax Hawes Fellowship basically goes to somebody uh, who in her honor is named as an individual who has made a difference in some way in contributing uh, to the nation's heritage through advocacy and education. 
And this year's uh, Best Lomax Hawes recipient is Carolyn Mazulumi, a quilter, historian, organizer, and from Ohio. Let's give her a round of applause. Carolyn Mazulumi. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> You're looking very, very wonderful tonight. I love the, uh, the outfit. Thank you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, tell us a little bit about your inspiration to, to organize the Women of Color Quilters Network. Well, quilting has been a very important part of my life for the last 35 years, and I felt that there had to be an organization to let African American quilters know the importance of what they do, the cultural significance, as well as the monetary value of what they make mm -hmm. insofar as quilts. Now, you are somebody involved in organizing quilters, uh, curating, you've written books on music and quilting, but let's talk a little bit about what you've got here. Tell me about your quilts. Um, I brought three quilts that I've made, and the first quilt here is called Singing His Praises, and always I'm inspired by something in my life uh, you know, that would inspire me to make a quilt. And I grew up in the South, outside of uh, New Orleans, southern Louisiana, in the Southern Baptist Church. You cannot separate the music <laughs> from the people, right. okay? <laughs> you cannot. So I had to do something, make something to celebrate uh, spirituals in our lives. So hence, singing his praises. Yeah, okay. And the... the <laughs> The quilt at the top is called Made in America, M-A-I-D, and it celebrates all the maids in the South for decades and decades that have worked so hard making a living, doing domestic work, sometimes the only money coming into a family, but they work so hard to take care of their family, so hence Made in America. Okay. It's to honor <laughs> all those women. <laughs> uh, you know, I like this idea of quilts getting applause. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. great. <laughs> this, is, this is performance quilting here we've got going. That's great. And the last quilt, I, as a quilt maker, every other quilt I make deals with the status of women. And this particular quilt at the end here is called Precious. Um, this is the work of women to raise children as first teachers. That's an important position to be in. So I, I like to indicate that in my work. Mm -hmm. Women have the most important job on the planet, and that's raising children. Yeah. <laughs> and it's the most influential job on the planet, because everybody comes through us, every human being, so we have that capacity to influence everybody. So this is a celebration of the life's work that we do as women. Even if we didn't give birth to children, we're nurturing somebody. Uh -huh. <laughs> so so let's, let's hear about uh, your approach to child rearing three sons, oh. huh? I said earlier, uh, <laughs> this week I have three sons, and in talking about the importance of the status of women, what we have to say is important. I often say women don't settle differences necessarily through violence or bombs or bullets. We have something much more powerful, and that's the sword of our tongue. Because we have the capacity, we have the capacity to bring our children to our knees. Just ask when they don't listen. Even as adults, you, that's a mother's special position yeah. with their children. Are, so. are any, any kids in the house tonight? Yeah, children should know. Children of any age, okay? So, well, I'm, all my children are grown, yeah. but th that still holds. What yeah. I have to say is important, and they better listen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I want to I go back to your quilts. I mean, th they're, they're different kinds of quilts that go with your individuality and your own life, and, and they really almost seem like uh, documentary photographs that tell a story, but of course, right. you, you've done the stenciling and the printing, and you piece mm -hmm. them. 
Uh, well, these are narrative quilts, mm -hmm. and that's my specialty. And for most of the people in the network that I founded, they do narrative work. We are people of many stories. Um, that narrative quilt tradition was brought here from Africa. We continue that today. And it's a way to tell the stories not only of our family, what's happening in our community, but what's happening in our nation as well. Yeah. Let's tell them uh, you had another kind of career out there. Yes. You like airplanes. I do. Ever since I was a child, uh, I've been fascinated with airplanes, and uh, that's my education. Yeah, aerospace a, engineering. Yes. How about that? <laughs> yes. And, and your, your quilts are fabulously precise and careful as to line and design. Well, yes, it's important to me. Uh, every line has to match, every corner has to meet. Uh, it's important. Yeah, mm. for the quilters out there, you know, it's important. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, you've also lined up exhibitions. Uh, you did work in, in South Africa in honor of Nelson Mandela. What's it like curating for that? Tell us about that one. Well, I conceived this idea a, a few years ago to uh, create a quilt show to honor Nelson Mandela's 67 years of service, and unfortunately, he passed away, and I uh, still went on with uh, the help of Dr. Marsha McDowell from Michigan State University, and we had uh, commissioned 80 quilts to honor Nelson Mandela, and that show opened uh, less than two months ago in Johannesburg, and it was a project that involved African-American quilters and white quilters, Hispanic quilters, everybody here in the United States uh, that was a, that's a quilt maker and wanted to participate, as well as half the quilt makers coming from South Africa. So it was truly an international project for a man that is much loved by the entire world. Mm -hmm. So we celebrated him and his 67 years of service to his country. Well, tonight, Carolyn, we are celebrating and curating you oh, as you. a National Heritage <laughs> Fellow. Give her a round of applause thank one you. more time. Carolyn Mazlumi. <laughs> Thank and her beautiful you. quilts and all her great work. You know, there's an undercurrent theme tonight that I find very interesting because I'm fascinated by how all the deep traditional cultures of the Americas and really anywhere, how they often contribute to a popular culture and the vernacular that we often share as, na as nations. And particularly here, uh, the Irish in America have contributed to vaudeville, uh, and moved from the intimacy of the small sessions and the Cayleys over the years to popular culture. You think of uh, Jimmy Cagney. Uh, I used to watch Dennis Day, the tenor on the Jack Benny show as a little kid, and of course, River Dance. And you can think of many, many other examples where the deep tradition has gone out into popular culture. And it's important to know about that and support the deep tradition. Kevin Doyle is an Irish dancer who uh, carries on in literally the steps of his mother uh, who brought this uh, to America from Ireland. But he also had some of his own uh, twists and turns along the way. From Providence, Rhode Island, let's meet Kevin Doyle. All right, all right. Thank you. Yeah. So, so tell me about Mama's teaching and uh, how it went down for you. Well, Mama's teaching started early at the age of eight years old for me. And growing up in Providence in uh, the 50s and 60s in the Irish community, there was a very heavily concentration of Irish on uh, the east side of Providence. So it was a lot of Irish hoolies, a lot of kitchen rackets, a lot of uh, Irish gatherings where everybody would have their party pieces, whether it be songs or their favorite tunes, and definitely step dancing. My mom always would jump up and do some step dancing. Mm. So it was like, we really loved to watch my mom dance, and we, we wanted to do that as well. Okay, I understood kitchen rackets. Hoolies? Hoolies, something like we had at the Irish Embassy last night. Oh, oh that one, yeah. <laughs> now I get it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, that was a nice little gathering where there's that amazing sort of dignity of the dance, and yet everyone's having a really good time, and competing yeah. a little, and joking a little, and That's flirting a little, about, and all the things that go on there. It's all about the Irish uh, getting together. It's, uh, 
They really enjoy the music. They love their uh, folk art. They, uh, they love passing it on down to keep the tradition alive. And uh, that's what my mom did with us. Uh, every morning she would, uh, well, every afternoon when she would teach her steps. But before we went to school in the morning, she would make sure they were still fresh in our minds. Oh, yeah. She'd be in front of the kitchen sink. And what she <laughs> used was uh, mouth music called lilting. And that was a form of music that they used often in Ireland and in this country as well. When there wasn't uh, instruments in the house, they would actually use their mouth to lilt the tune. And then you would dance to whatever the tune would be. Could we just hear a little of the mouth? Yes, my mom's uh, favorite was McLeod's reel, which she lilted right for me, right to uh, when she passed two years ago at the age of 93. With Alzheimer's and all, there's one thing that never left her was how to lilt. And when my daughter, Shannon, was dancing, she would be with me and she would lilt and it went like dum diddly diddly di diddly dum diddly diddly di diddly dum diddly diddly di diddly di up up diddly dum. All right. <laughs> and uh, we, we want to point out that also near the kitchen sink learning steps was your sister Maureen. My sister Maureen was my partner for why she won't get mad at me, I hope, but over 40 some years. And, um, <laughs> How could you get she, mad at she? She was, well, she's still <laughs> talking to me. She's with me tonight, in fact. And she yeah. was six years old when she started dancing. So uh, we've been doing it for quite some time. And um, my mom used to make sure that we learned those steps of before we went off to uh, school in the morning, we'd go through that and off we'd go. Let's see if uh, you remember what your mom taught you. Can we get Maureen out here and join you in a jig? I think we can. All right, let's give him a round of applause. Kevin Donnelly, Marine Donnelly, Royal. Oops, oops, oops. Maureen Doyle, Kevin Doyle, fantastic. Yeah. Okay. Now, in oh, thank you. In the uh, <laughs> in the world of, of Irish music, we've been talking about the family activities and learning, um, and and there is a little aspect, so we understand, of competition at times. And uh, this is something uh, you wore in the competitive days. Yeah. Nice. I don't know if that would fit much anymore, but that was actually the first uh, costume they sent over from Ireland, from Castle Ray, where my mom was from. And it's made of the finest wool of Ireland, but it was also used for all the can dance competitions when it was about 98 degrees out. <laughs> well, that, that's why there's a plenty we of had some uh, air breathing conditioning room. going, yes. <laughs> yeah, we were talking about his his sister and daughter and others, uh, how we were going to try and get him into it somehow. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we, we gave up on that, but it sounded like a good time. <laughs> yeah, that was uh, the first medal I won right over there in 1959 in Boston. And um, that was what we had to, to wear. These are the traditional Irish colors of Ireland for the competitions and the, the uniforms that we wore. Now, in the competitions, I mean, uh, um, how did that go? How, you know, how was it set up and what went on? What did you have to dance? How, who were the masters? Tell us about the setup. Well, 
that was part of the progression of the step dance for me. My mom wanted to take us to a, a more structured setting where we'd be a little more focused and learn some more steps that were a little more intricate and also eligible for uh, competitions. So we started learning from uh, two wonderful people that used to come to Providence every Sunday afternoon, Mary Sullivan and Steve Carney. And with those steps, I entered many competitions. And some of the steps my mom taught me were from the dance masters that were in, came from Ireland. And these guys would travel to the villages and stay six to eight weeks at a time in the villages and teach the people of the village to dance. So these guys were like very well respected guys. They walked with a big staff, very colorful clothing, put up in the nicest homes. And there was a lot of times if there was another dance master that encroached on this territory, there'd be a challenge, a dance off. <laughs> they, would, they would take the front doors off the cottages, put them in the, right in the village square, and oftentimes last man standing would be the victorious one, which would give him the right to teach in the other dance master's territory. <laughs> so it was also common in those days, too, that if the vil another village was envious of the step dancer style, the master style, they would go over there and kidnap that guy and take him to their village. Wow. So Dance wars. That doesn't go on anymore, <laughs> but sometimes in Providence, Rhode Island, that still happens. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Captured dance masters. Well, we, we've got you here we're under no duress. Would you give us a, a hornpipe uh, from the Love old to. school of Very competition? Very traditional hornpipe. Kevin Doyle. You know, even though he is a great competitive dancer, and I saw him do a wonderful competition dance last night at the embassy, uh, competition in this world does not involve dancing as well as doing narrations at the same time. So let me take this moment to introduce the band back here and catch his breath. Donna Long on piano. I know you know her. Josh Kane on flute. Junior Stevens, accordion. Yeah, Junior. And somehow, Seamus Connolly made it back. He was a 2013 National Heritage Fellow. As long as there'll be Irish uh, dance and culture here, I think Seamus is going to find a way to get here. It's very appropriate. Uh, and I'll just mention that uh, we both grew up uh, seeing Jimmy Cagney in a film called I'm a Yankee Doodle Dandy, which came out some years 
after World War I and was a, a meant to lift people's spirits in, into the 30s and the idea of being all American. But uh, he came out of the Irish American world in, in the Cohen movie. And uh, well, tell him, you, you saw the film. What did it do for you? I saw that film when I was 10 years old. And as soon as I seen Jimmy Cagney doing those steps, the military tap, and those patriotic songs, I ran running out to the kitchen and said, Mom, I'm not going to step, quit step dancing, but I really like to look at some tap dance as well. My mom always made sure that I followed my passion. So she found a nice place for me to go and learn some steps. And actually, I ended up at Teresa Landry's studio in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, who's with us tonight. She's 92 years old, still <laughs> teaches two days a week. And she's right over here in the audience tonight. She came to Washington, D.C. Yeah. She is right here. So, like many of the Irish step dancers when they came to this country, yeah. they um, really didn't want to see much of the step dancers back in the early 60s. And unless it was St. Patrick's Day, everybody would have their corned beef and cabbage. And <laughs> my sister Maureen and I would go out and do five, six places of an evening. And they'd say, Thank you very much. Uh, we'll see you next year. That was wonderful. <laughs> Yeah. So I went into a lot of tap dance, and as well as some comp competing on different shows, like the Ted Matt show in New York City, uh, which was like the wow. pre-show uh, to America's Got Talent, where the public votes <laughs> on the winners, you know? <laughs> so it was very, very much a, a big part of my repertoire on the tap. This is kind of a Ted Mack thing tonight, don't you think, a little bit? Yeah, it is. I'm s well, this is a wonderful we're, we're audience. We're not quite I'll that corny. I think they're all winners here tonight, though. We think we're cooler than that, I think, though. I mean, did you, did you think Ted Mack was really, really happening? Got Absolutely. Him? Okay. All right. Absolutely. He was a tough <laughs> man to get to and a tough pl a place to get on that show. Oh, so. yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he was well-respected. Well, you know, you got to make sure you put the right stuff on the radio, man. Yeah. yeah. And, and as a matter of fact, tonight, I'm playing valet here to help him out, putting the right stuff. This, this program will air on American Roots over Thanksgiving, but right now I'm going to hand you your, uh, your boater and uh, give us a little bit of that uh, Yankee Doodle Dandy This work. is a routine that Teresa taught me. This is actually a straw hat belonged to her father, and uh, I'm going to do the George M. Cohan routine. All right, Kevin Doyle one more time. Take your hat. <laughs> All right. Yeah. That's you, Teresa. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, a little retro showbiz here. It's good. Now, I know, Kevin, over the years you've done an awful lot of teaching, uh, but you've got a very special student we're going to bring out here to join uh, with your sister, Maureen, to close out with some reels. Yes, um, 
I get a great joy of teaching a lot of children in school programs, and a lot of that's been made available to me through the Rhode Island Council on the Arts and Dr. Winnie Lambert that got me here tonight. So, round of applause, please, yes. But there's a special student that I have. She's actually my daughter, and Shannon, and she's gonna be joined by my sister Maureen. We're gonna end off with a beautiful set of reels. All right. And it goes like this. Let's bring out the family here, folks. Sister Maureen and daughter Shannon. All right. How about that Doyle family? All right. Thank you. Kevin Doyle. A little more music is coming up, but uh, first we're going to go back to that uh, quiet realm, I suppose, in terms of the results, uh, but not quiet in terms of the maker. We're going to meet uh, Yvonne Walker. Kishik, uh, she is an Odawa quill worker and a basket maker uh, of great renown up in Michigan from Petoskey, which is, if you know Michigan and the mitten and the thumb, it's, I got that right? Yeah, up here. I just shouldn't do geography with my hand, but Michigan makes it possible. And uh, we are about to meet her. She's been to the Smithsonian and been around. Her work is just phenomenal, I think you'll find. Let's meet her if she's ready to come out and meet us. We got a and here she comes. All right, Yvonne. Hi. Hello. Welcome to, I was going to say our table, but it's really your table because uh, this is all your, your work right here. It's just beautiful. And you're looking you. very much like Autumn. Yes. <laughs> yeah? Because yeah. I was born in October, I was named Falling Leaves Woman. Ah. Oh. Well, and you've got the falling leaves on the ribbon shirt, <laughs> just beautiful. And, and the bolo uh, turtle? It's uh, my clan symbol. <clears throat> I'm a turtle uh, clan on my mother's side and water snake on my father. Okay. But we're here tonight to talk about the porcupine. Yes. And the porcupine's quills. And how did you, uh, how did you get involved in doing this quill work? Well, when I was uh, in my early 20s, um, I was very shy and, and couldn't find a job. so. Uh, Kennedy, um, President Kennedy and Johnson's War on Poverty Program came and said, have we got a job for you? And they placed me in uh, working in an arts and crafts art school. And the woman who taught me how to do quill work, she worked at that same co-op. Co so um, her name was Susan Shaganui. Yeah, and she was, uh, I think, a remarkable woman in your estimation. Could you describe her quilting, I mean her quilting, her quill uh, work technique? Um, she was an unusual woman, multitasking. Um, 
She had a, a dip in her lip where she kept a mouthful of quills, and then uh, she would uh, dish them out one at a time, but she also chewed gum, drank coffee, smoked cigarettes, <laughs> all at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that sounds like that would deserve a Heritage Award for sure, too. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> tell, t tell us about uh, some of the designs that you've got here. Um, the earliest known quill boxes were made um, with a lot of bark showing, like this one. This is called a cross quill. And since we didn't have a written language, whatever was inside the box, the picture was put on top. So in this case, this would be dried choke cherries. Let's see if we can get a, get a look at that. Yeah. yeah. And then just to decorate it and cover it up, you know, they, they put the cross quills around the top and the bottom. Mm -hmm. And then uh, when Europeans came and they saw the quality of the quill work, then they wanted uh, or asked, you know, for other kinds of quill boxes. So they started making uh, boxes to store handkerchiefs or gloves or, or pencil cases. And then it evolved eventually um, into art forms like these. Um, this is a solid quill. There's basically four, four kinds of quill boxes. This is a solid quill, and uh, because it's completely covered with quills. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the open face, because it's called open face because you can see part of the bark on it. One thing we want to say though is there's no dye in here. These are actual those the are, colors. Those are natural colors. Of, yeah. of the quill, so you go, mm -hmm. you have to very carefully arrange uh, the dark quills to get that contrast. Right. So. Every quill we put in is an instant decision. So if you can't make up your mind about anything, come see me. I'll teach you. Uh -huh. make decision. <laughs> and then, <laughs> you might have a lot of takers in this ADD world. <laughs> <laughs> now the other kind of quill box, this, this is called a spider web because of the lacy look to it. Mm -hmm. To this day, I haven't decided what is a spider and which one is, uh, which, one is which. Um, this box was designed by her husband and her, uh, um, herself, Susan Shaganabe, and her husband, Charlie. So this was their special, unique contribution, you know, to the art, you know, the quill work art. So we have a little uh, plastic box of quills here, and uh, these, are the, these are the items you work with. L let's talk about the porcupine for a moment. You have, a, I think, a complex relationship to um, the porcupine. I do. Uh, I consider the porcupine my brother because I work with the quills so close and so often, you know, and I have a story because people ask how old have people been doing quill work, so I tell this joke. And the joke is uh, two porcupines are in the woods and they're peeking out of the woods looking, you know, at this man in the center of the village and he's making black ash baskets. And the one porcupine says to the other, geez, I hope they don't invent quill work. <laughs> <laughs> now you you have actually uh, you've gone after a porcupine yourself. I have. Um, most porcupine quill hunters, you know, will uh, if they don't have quills, they'll hunt the porcupine. It is uh, one of the only animals in Michigan that is not protected, so um, it is open season on porcupines. <laughs> yeah. Oh, but the porcupine is protected it, it, by it, quills. <laughs> as, as a food source, it is. It's protected as a food source. Yeah. And, and uh, you've gone out and gathered, gathered porcupines so long the highway, have. too. Yeah. I have. Yeah, I, can, we, can, were, we were out one time in the spring looking for morale mushrooms, and uh, my sister Pauline went along with me, and, and I kept an eye on her because she's nervous about being in the woods. That's funny for an Indian. But, uh, <laughs> but, I, <laughs> but I noticed from the way she was walking that she was getting upset, you know, and her hands went together and she turned and started walking towards me. So I stopped and I said, what's the matter? And she says, there's an animal over there. She said, I think it's a porky. So I said, oh, go to the car and get the baseball bat. Well, she, <laughs> she took off in a hurry. And I realized, I realized the porcupine was waking up. He had been sleeping in the sun. And I broke off a, a, a stick to use as a club. And I went over there and I said, I'm sorry. Whack. <laughs> Didn't hit him hard enough. I'm sorry. Whack. So, and, and hit him again. 
whack every time I, I said I'm sorry, I think about four times. And then the porky didn't move. Well, I heard snuffing behind me, and I thought, what's that noise? You know, and I thought, another porcupine? So I turned and looked, and there was my daughter, and she was crying. She, mm -hmm. she saw me kill that porky. And I said, I'm a co-worker. That's what we do. You know? yeah. So, but, um... <laughs> you. you know, uh, Yvonne, uh, since you can tell jokes, um, <laughs> We have come up with a term this week for some that you've gathered on the highway. We call them road quills. Yeah, right. <laughs> Sorry about right. that, folks. But, but also people bring them to your house. They do. I get off work sometimes, and uh, there'll be uh, a pelt laying or two, sometimes laying on the porch. Uh, we only get the pelts in the wintertime when it's freezing. So once they're killed, they freeze. And so one year I ended up, because I placed an ad in the paper for pelts that I ended up with 56 porkies on my back porch. Wow. That's a lot of clearing to do, huh? Yeah. A lot of quill work ahead of yeah. you. Well, uh, we just appreciate all the great work that's here. Give her a round of applause. Thank you so much. Yvonne, Walker, Kasich. Nice talking with you. You too. <laughs> great Adawa, quill work. So we're going to end kind of as we began, in the spirit. And I think you're going to like this. Uh, you know, we started in the deep community, in the, in the church, in the communal setting. Uh, the Holmes brothers started in the communal setting down in Christ Church, Virginia. And gospel music was very important to them. Uh, but they listened to the radio, and uh, they grew into the world, and uh, they managed to make music that includes not just the gospel and spirituals, but also into the secular soul sound and blues and rhythm and blues and country and all rock and rolled into one distinct style. Uh, that's what I really like about these gentlemen. And they also did something that I think is uh, rather unique, uh, which is they, in the course of their life, uh, moved from the church to the juke joint and then moved from the juke joint up to New York City uh, where they met their wonderful falsetto singer and uh, drummer, Popsy Dixon. So really, this is a full circle in that it's deep culture that's gone out into the big world. And we've seen this with the orchestra. Uh, we've also seen it uh, in the Irish cultural tradition as well. And right now, I hear, uh, I hear Wendell, Wendell Holmes uh, playing the guitar. You're back there somewhere, Wendell. Yeah, just give us a couple of little riffs, would you? You know, if you listen closely, you can kind of hear a little bit of country, a little bit of soul, a little bit of blues uh, in, in just about everything that he does. Uh, have you folks heard the Holmes Brothers before? <laughs> yeah, good. You're, then you're all ready to be in the right place as we, uh, we go from a juke joint uh, and church to the big stage here at the National Heritage Fellows Concert. Make them welcome, the Holmes Brothers. <laughs> Thank you so very much. It's such a pleasure and an honor to be here. I feel it, I feel it there. In my hand, Woo! in my hand. Feel it, feel it, down in my feet, in my feet, oh, sometimes, 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 yeah, 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 <laughs> sometimes when I'm all alone, all alone, sometimes when all my friends are gone, they're gone, I gotta run back, run, run back. back, run on back, run, run back. back. Run back, run, oh, oh, oh. run, 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 back. run back to the hills, from where's coming my strength. Woo. Uh, uh, May. Like me, yes, sir. 
at this party. Woo! Oh, oh, oh. So, 
Sweet the sound, the Holmes Brothers. Man, it, you always sound like you're uh, more than three voices, more than four voices. You're, you, you know, uh, you, your guitar is a voice, I'd have to say, Wendell. Well, thank you so very much. Try to make it so. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well uh, you've succeeded. Uh, you know, just tell me, take us back. You, how'd you like the, uh, the singing and praying bands from uh, Delaware? Tell you something. Maryland. The best I've ever seen. They're great. Yeah. More than great. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and that's really, that's some of the world that you grew up in, too, out there in Absolutely. the coastal parts of uh, Virginia. Virginia, yes. That's correct. Yeah. yeah. Tell me about church and uh, you and your brother in church. Well, you know, we grew up in a place called Christ Church, Virginia. <laughs> it's now called Saluda. But, you know, <laughs> we were very fortunate when we learned uh, to play we had a cousin that had a juke joint. So when he couldn't get the good bands on Saturday nights, he would call his cousins. <laughs> <laughs> and it was such a small community, other people couldn't play anything and we couldn't play much. So it was like big fish in a little pond. Uh -huh. So we played in the churches on Sunday. We like to say we rocked them on Saturdays and saved them on Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> Got them to the mourner's bench by Sunday. Let, let the preacher handle things by Sunday. Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, this, this world that you grew up and out of, um, you listen to the radio. Where does the country music come into the mix? Well, you know, the country music, I have to tell you, the black stations <laughs> had very little wattage back in the 50s and late 40s. So we could be listening to Jimmy Reed and all of a sudden, Hank Williams would come through with 100,000 watts. <laughs> so we learned to love the country music, and that's where it comes from. Yeah. And I, and I hear in your guitar style, a little country chops rolling through. Country and soul kind of just blending like fine Country whiskey. licks for country guys. Yeah, man. All right. But then you go up to the big city. Uh, what gets you go, to go to New York City? Well, actually, I have to tell you, my brother went first, Sherman. He, uh, well? Sherman, why don't you talk about it? Sherman, yeah. Why don't you tell him? Well, I was playing with a guy by the name of Jimmy Jones, who had a record I called Handyman and Good Timing. And he needed a guitar player. He said, you know a guitar player? I said, my brother played guitar. So I went down on the night that he graduated and shipped him right on back to New, New York with me. <laughs> and we've been doing this ever since. <laughs> Now, back there, uh, you know, the mix of uh, percussion and falsetto singing is something special. Uh, Popsy, when do you uh, join in with the Holmes Brothers, and how does that well, happen? I joined up with them in 1967. Mm. And going, now it's going on, what, 46 years? Yeah. That's longer than most marriages. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you got 10,000 years to go. <laughs> <laughs> T tell me about your voice. W when did you discover this voice, or, or did it discover you? I, I, where is it from? Well, that's a, that's a good question. Only thing I can say to just to summarize the whole thing, my voice is a gift from God. Yeah, yeah. How difficult is it for you to drum and sing at the same time? I mean, you make it sound easy, smooth. But is it hard for you to make that all happen at once? Well, it's hard work. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, you guys make hard work uh, look awfully easy, I have to say it. Um, 
Let's hear a little bit more from the Holmes brothers. That be all right? All righty, all right. All right, bring them back. Holmes. Wendell Holmes, Sherman Holmes, Popsy Dixon. <laughs> this next song is a song that my brother Sherman wrote. It's called Close the Door and Walk Away. There's a voice on the phone. Yeah, I'm soon stand alone. That's your lover. Catch your lover. Please the crowd, one for free. To a soon turn the key. When you're cold, run for cover. I can't stand your conversation. It brings out the worst in me. We're Situation. If you only let me be, though you knew you were wrong, when you strung me along in your love, second rate. I saw ice in your eye when I reached for the prize. It's too late. story about this next song. This song I wrote after I got to be an old man. At the time when I was a young man, I used to party, party, party all the time. Now you see me, I can hardly catch my breath. <laughs> so I wrote this song, and the name of it is, I stayed at the party too long. <laughs> Give it a 
Popsy, Dixon. We don't want to stay at the party too long, but would you like to see the 2014 NEA National Heritage Fellows just one more time? All right. From Hogansburg, New York, Henry Arquette. From Austin, Texas, Manuel Cowboy Donnelly. From Providence, Rhode Island, Kevin Doyle. From Petoskey, Michigan, Yvonne Walker Kiesik. The singing and praying bands of Maryland. <laughs> Reverend Jerry Colbert. From Philadelphia, Vera Nakonetsi. From the state of Ohio, Westchester, the town, Carolyn Mazlumi. From 
Walt Hill, Nebraska, Rufus White. <laughs> And from Christ Church, Virginia, New York City, the whole world, the Holmes Brothers. The 2014 National Heritage Fellows. I was standing by my window.